discussion. Uh, we had a last minute change. Jeremy Tate of the Classical Learning Test was supposed to be here, but unfortunately he had to bolt uh, unexpectedly. Uh, Eric Twist, who I'll let him introduce himself in a minute, was going to moderate the conversation. Uh, and I said, well, you're not going to moderate anymore. You're just going to participate in the conversation. Uh, and since Andrew Zorneman and myself and Eric are all friends, uh, we're really excited about just yelling at each other for the next hour or so. No, we're not. Um, we also decided this would be better if we brought some Burgundy wine, mm. and then we realized it was 10 in the morning, so we have uh, whiskey instead. No. We <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I am very excited for this. Before we get started, though, uh, I do just want to give honor to Arcadia Education. So this is uh, Eric Twist, who's running Arcadia Education. They are sponsoring this panel. Um, and again, this, this is a little like the, the promo for Cana uh, or the promo for CAP. It, rather than just read it, uh, Arcadia is such a, a good friends of great hearts. Uh, there, there really is no company like it right now that is not only providing you know, some of the academic help to schools, but I would say the, the core of what they're doing is really operational support. Um, uh, Eric says something about, your, your motto is in Latin, it's something about the beautiful operations, beautiful. Well, I, I, we were, I'm not even sure if it's good <laughs> Latin, but. Uh, um, so if yeah, you are from that, schools and you're thinking that about operations and operational help if you're launching schools, please keep Arcadia uh, in mind. They're doing not just great work, but what I think is really unique work in the, in the country. So thank you, of course, for the sponsorship for this, Eric. Um, I didn't even know we did that. Yeah, you did that's that. so good of us. Yeah, that's because your yeah. people know a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so let me just do introductions. You all, I think, know who I am by now. Jake Tawney, Chief Academic Officer for Great Hearts Academies. Uh, let me turn to, to my very good friend, Andrew Zorneman, uh, and let him introduce himself, who he is, who he's from, uh, and then we'll move to Eric, and then we'll, we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Zorneman. I'm the president and co-founder of Kane Academy. We're an academy for teachers, uh, so we provide uh, training and materials for humanities teachers. Uh, we travel the country, uh, we're very adaptive, very mobile. In 2023, we trained over 1,200 teachers. Uh, we would love to support your mission. Uh, if there's any way we can serve you, let us know. You can reach uh, any of us at our, our website, www.canaacademy.org. Our specialties are seminar leadership, how to teach history, how to teach fiction, uh, how to teach uh, philosophical texts, and uh, how to teach poetry and writing. Eric? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, Eric Twist, I had the, uh, the fortune of, uh, the good fortune of uh, being with Great Hearts for about 17 years. I think I started with Great Hearts when we had about 600 kids and uh, it got bigger over time. Um, got to do a lot of different things at Great Hearts, uh, taught medieval history and humane letters and those things, dean of students. Uh, opened uh, uh, an elementary school for us, got to oversee the expansion of all of our elementary schools, our archways, uh, and then uh, was, uh, did some external affairs and things for a while, and then was president of Great Hearts Arizona for f five years, six years, I can't remember. Um, and uh, thank you for the kind words about Arcadia. Great. Um, so what we'd like to do, we, we titled the talk Chat GPT, but I do think we want to broaden this conversation a little bit. And what I thought I would do, somehow I got tapped to try to give the details of what a large language model actually is. Uh, so, but I do think it's important. I think having some of those details about what it is and what, what it isn't uh, can help us shape some of the questions about the impact on students, on student culture, on culture at large. And, and I suspect that we will bounce uh, somewhere in between the death of the soul and the apocalypse of the world uh, as we're, we're talking about these technologies. Or at least I will. I don't know. Eric will say controversial things and we'll yell at each other and it'll be great fun for us. I'll do my best. Um, so large language models, I'm not gonna obviously go through the details of this, but I, I think some things are really relevant, right? Uh, the way that a large language model works is by way of pattern prediction, right? So it is not a truth module, right? It is a pattern module. Uh, quite literally when you, and I think probably a lot of people in the room have had experience with something like ChatGPT, when you type a question into it, it's not really just a search engine. It's not combing through articles and lifting text from it. Um, when, when the folks who rolled out OpenAI were at, when they first did this in, in front of a group of reporters, uh, one of the reporters says, like, this is really, this is really incredible. Like, what are your source texts? Uh, and, and the creators of OpenAI said, no, 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 you, you don't get it, right? The, the things that are being produced are novel. 
that this is not a search engine where you say, you know, what does Aristotle say about the nature of the soul? And it's going and doing a search uh, on Aristotle, the nature of the soul, and it's lifting text. Uh, the text that's coming out of this really is novel text that has not been written uh, by any human person. And the way that that works is by way of patterns. Right? It knows that you have this word, and there is quite literally a certain probability that words follow from that. Um, now, that's amazing in some ways, right? The, the, that's as simple as it is, and yet ChatGPT can be uh, as good as it is. Uh, you know, when, when you go there and have it, say, write a full essay or write a job description or just engage with you about a math problem, it's really remarkable how good it seems to be. And yet all it's doing is pattern recognition. It's a probability game. I won't go into the details of neural networks and how that works, um, but it is, it is doing something fundamentally different than the way the human person perceives things, right? We start with holes by, by nature. We start with essences and natures. And, and then we drill down and start to construct arguments. Uh, large language models are actually building up from the ground up, right? They're starting with, with almost disconnected, incoherent details and piecing them together uh, in a way that seems to be modeled by other texts that are out there. Finally, if, uh, if we think that the large language models themselves are limited only to the data that's being fed to them, we're also wrong about that. Uh, because a lot of these models now have already combed through basically the entire internet, and the models themselves are now starting to generate their own training data. Uh, at first, that seemed to accelerate them and how good they got. There was a paper a little bit ago that had them uh, that showed that as they started generating their own data, they actually got a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. But some of the research coming out now is saying that that itself might end up being sort of self-fixing. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are out there. Uh, I want to start close to home. So I want to start with ChatGPT and the students, and then we'll, we'll sort of see where this conversation goes. So, so my question, and I'll, I'll start with Andrew here, is, you know, with the advent of ChatGPT where a student can go in and say, um, I'll use an example from Great Hearts, you know, please give me a ways in which essay on the Great Gatsby that is uh, five paragraphs long, uh, with, with three core paragraphs, an opening and an intro, and ChatGPT can present that and can do it in a way that some people might find convincing. What is the impact on the student essay, on, on the concept of an essay in class? Uh, I, I think the, perhaps the more important question, what's the impact on the student? Mm. So um, the overwhelming majority of liberal learning is inductive, and the, the students accrue understanding and wisdom uh, over years of many exercises in solving problems, translating from one language to another, writing essays, reading books, having discussions, acting on stage, composing uh, works of music and uh, works of visual art. I, I'm most concerned about uh, chat GPT uh, short-circuiting the inductive learning that's inherent to a, a young person becoming a free person that is free from, um, free from either uh, ignorance uh, or free from kind of being enslaved to the opinions and the, uh, the forces of others. And if someone else is doing the thinking for the student, uh, then there's no sense in which that's really an essay. An essay is a working through a problem in verbal form. And uh, so the, the immediate problem is uh, our students who we are charged to train to be independent thinkers, to, th to think freely about the most important things. They, they read expository literature because expository works challenge us to think through the most important questions. What does it mean to be a human? Who is God? What is justice? What is friendship? What is love? Um, what should a polity look like? What should law look like? What are the possibilities of law? Uh, you know, cultivating virtue. All these are the kind of questions that expository works ask us to think through. Imaginative works think, uh, uh, challenge us. Uh, they, they move us the way we ought to be moved. They afford us experiences that we ought to have that are more aesthetic than they are um, uh, intellectual or, or didactic or ex ex expositional. So uh, mm -hmm. if the students are not thinking through those things on their own, if they're not actually experiencing uh, you know, sympathizing with the character, but actually relying on somebody on on, on a um, 
uh, uh, programs working through uh, what you know what sympathy is, then I think the the whole experience has been lost. The whole uh, intellectual. Uh, search and discovery has been lost. So that's my principal concern: is that um, our our students will be ill served. Uh, there's the the re the related moral concern: is that the it'll increase the temptation to uh, shortchange themselves and to cheat and uh, just to you know pass in uh, someone else's work as their own. But so let me push into this a, a little bit. Uh, I let me put an argument out there. Uh, I'm not confident I believe it. I'm not confident I don't believe it. But it's certainly one that's there. And, and the parallel here is something with like a calculator in math class, right? So you know, it used to be that a pre-calculus teacher would spend you know four weeks on the laws of all, uh, logarithms, uh, and 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 that was because there was a lot of instruction about how to use lookup tables to get actual values of logarithms by using these laws. Mm -hmm. um, with the advent of the calculator, we don't have those lookup tables anymore. Uh, and, and, and so we can spend less time on some of the laws and get to higher uh, things in math. Is there a way in which uh, something like ChatGPT could be used uh, in order to do some lower level things for the students uh, so that they can then access higher level things more efficiently and more quickly? Or is the math argument completely wrong? It's completely wrong. Um, I, I, I think that uh, I, I like what Andrew said, and, 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 and so the educator has to think about the, um, the, 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 the pedagogical methods that are, are shaping the hearts and minds of, of these malleable, you know, souls. And I think of that, you know, I don't like him very much as a philosopher, but he has a great... I think he has some great insight into this, funny enough. Francis Bacon's, you know, off-quoted, uh, reading maketh a full man. I th hopefully I get this right. Reading maketh a full man, conference a ready man, and writing an exact man. And so I, I wonder if there's a, uh, I think some of the teachers here will have some insights into this, but the sort of interior pedagogy that's happening when you're forced to sit down and... Uh, take thoughts that you have from the reading and the conference that you do from the from the uh, from the uh, uh, seminars that you engage in, and you you know everybody sort of had this experience where you think you have something in your mind, and you think it's clear, and there's a weird thing going on where you're you're you're, you're both thinking and feeling, and imaging in your mind uh, some truth statement, some some opinion, whatever it might be, some insight. And you go to write it down, and you can't. And it's very frustrating. Uh, but there's, uh, there, there's a pedagogy in there somewhere that, that is forcing you. And I think this is what Bacon was getting at, is that there's an activity that's taking place that is a kind of refinement and, 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 and clarity building um, that, uh, that th I don't think as educators we want to lose those opportunities. And that's exactly what, what we would be Losing, and so I, I, I don't think the analogy with the with the math is uh, exactly right. I don't think it's apples to apples. I think I think we could explore that some more. Um, I, I do think that for adults, and maybe we could go there later. I do think that there are uh, real advantages to some of what you're describing in terms of <clears throat> um, uh, getting ideas uh, 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 formatted and structured in a particular way in a in in, in, a, in a more quick manner. Um, and, and we could talk about you know, how, how, how its uses are appropriate or inappropriate in that manner. But, but when we talk about what we're doing at the, at the level of uh, 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 student development, I think we lose so much of um, their ability to, to think clearly uh, by not forcing them through the process of writing. <laughs> yeah, please. To, to come a little closer to you on the uh, math analogy, um, both in mathematics and in humane letters, we're talking about language. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking about speech. And nothing gets done without speech. There, there's no learning, there's no uh, communication between human beings in anything without some mode of speech. Um, it is not the case that humane letters students uh, think on the big ideas or big issues or 
about the things that ought to move them without someone else's help. Mm -hmm. The whole beauty of humane letters is that they learn about justice at the feet of Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, Locke, Publius, uh, and they, they learn about um, things that they ought to be moved by at, at the feet of you know, Aeschylus, Dante, Shakespeare, Flannery O'Connor, Hemingway, and Crabbe. So the, the, there is help. Uh, but if we think about it in terms of speech, th think about this experience. Th think about the prohibition on speech. Uh, there's a beautiful movie that came out a few years ago called A Hidden Life. Uh, Terrence Malick's uh, story about uh, Franz Jägerstader, who was an Austrian conscript. He for, uh, refused to take the Hitler oath, and the Nazis threw him in prison. They tried him, and they eventually executed him. At one point in the film, you see him in a prison yard, and on the wall it says, Sprechen verboten, you know, speech is forbidden among the prisoners. Uh, another way they forbade speech is they, they didn't allow him to see his, his loved ones. And uh, so afraid even were the pastors of his church that they counseled him not to uh, disobey uh, and, and they encouraged him to go ahead and take the Hitler oath you know, for the, the consequences. Uh, and uh, increasingly his conscience was separated from the sources that could fuel it. So eventually, you know, Jägerstader sort of stood alone. He and God were alone in that decision not to take the Hitler oath. But, but if we move with him through the movie, we realize it's a terrible thing to be left alone. So I'm not arguing that the student sort of flies alone. I'm saying what we have to do is find a way for the student to speak the way a human ought to speak. And um, I, I'm worried that a chat GPT will create something like an isolation. It's sort of like, if, you, if you read uh, Mark Byerline's books, very good books on um, the current generation and how horribly impactful cell phones have been. You know, s children staying up all night, they're not closer to each other, they're farther away from each other. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and why? Because normal human discourse has been interrupted. Yeah. Normal human relationships have been interrupted. We call them humane letters because the books, the poetry, the histories, all the things that the students study illuminate for them what it means to be a human because they are in conversation, they're in speech with the greatest speakers who ever lived. And I, 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 like, I just want to pile on here that, that I like what you're saying, Andrew, that it seems to me that what, um, what uh, Snapchat and TikTok have done to human relationships and friendships that yeah. they're not sort of riding their bikes in the neighborhood anymore. They don't even care about getting driver's licenses to yeah. go see one another. Uh, that there's a barrier that's put in between them and the person that in a sense what LLMs do uh, at, the, at the school level is it puts a barrier between the student and Aristotle, puts yeah. a barrier between the student and Hemingway. Um, and, and that's an unfortunate thing, yes. right? That they, they don't have to really contend, sit there in the room after, after the seminar and after yeah. the reading and to say, do I, un do I understand the man? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and can I articulate that in a way that's truly coming from me? Uh, and, and so it, it ruins those relationships, which can be uh, rich and full and, and carry with you throughout your life. And that, that barrier is something I think we have to take very seriously as educators. Yeah. And this, this conference is about the great conversation, how to keep it alive. Yeah. There, there are really only a couple of ways that our students connect with the greatest minds and with each other. And, and the, the first way is by reading, and the second way is by writing. The third way is by discussion. Uh, but, but writing, uh, and you could say that reading, discussion, and writing are all forms of the same thing. That is, they're all visitations of the great texts. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the students have independent reading, which is very linear. Uh, then they have you know, discussions, which is very nonlinear, very lively, collaborative, lots of trials and errors. And then the most disciplined form of reading a text is to, to visit it and then write something down about it. But it's got to be your thought. Yeah. And, and the, that's the way that the mind connects with the greatest minds, mm -hmm. and in turn with those of us who are all engaged in trying to understand what the, yeah. those great minds had to say. Here, here's what I'm actually worried about. Right? So one of the most formative books uh, in my life has been Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. Mm -hmm. right? So Neil Postman's writing at the end of the 80s uh, with the, what, what he perceived as sort of the, the first generation that had television in their lives since the beginning. Um, the book is fundamentally about TV uh, in its particularity, but, but in the general, the general thesis is that uh, 
technology, particularly communication technology, is never neutral. Mm. Right. So, in fact, he, he says sort of at the beginning uh, to to write a book uh, with a thesis that technology can be used for good or evil is just banal. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. What's worthy of writing a book about is that technology forms us not by its misuse but by its use. The very act of using the technology forms us, and I think he's right about that. Um, and I think that uh, that's worthy of exploring how ChatGPT forms the student. So you kind of let off with this, Andrew. And so one of the things I'm very worried about is that ChatGPT is now the full, uh, the full expression of, uh, of a database culture, mm -hmm. right? Students have moved from, or culture has moved from a narrative mindset, mm. right? A mindset, a way of thinking that sees meaning, that seeks meaning, that tries to string together arguments uh, into a culture that is a lookup culture, right? Even 20 years ago in a math class, it was hard to give uh, extra credit problems because students would go to the internet to look them up. Uh, and we started having uh, not large language models, but some resources where they could even help the kids solve the problems. Uh, one of the things that worries me about ChatGPT is that it seems to be the fullness of that. And I think, mm -hmm. even though I don't think it's the same as a search engine, I do think, we've talked about this, that there is a way in which it's evolved out of that, and that it continues to, to, to solidify students' mindsets that the way to go about information is, is like a library catalog. You simply go to look it up to get the answer. Mm -hmm. and, and, and therein, I think they're losing this distinction that Aristotle has between true opinion and knowledge. Right? True opinion is uh, the idea of knowing something is true, but, but only because somebody has told you, you believe it, right? Whereas true knowledge is, I, I, have, I now understand why. I now understand why this is true. Uh, I think this move to a database culture forms students, uh, almost solidifies them completely in the realm, at best, of true opinion. At worst, of false opinion, mm -hmm. right? Um, does this seem right? I, I think that's a good way to put it. I, I was going to ask you a, a, a question um, as a master teacher of mathematics. Isn't it the case that uh, one could use a calculator to, to solve an advanced problem in calculus? Uh, at the same time, some of the work has to be you know, pencil to mm -hmm. paper. And isn't the case as a math teacher, you not only want your students to uh, solve the problem and solve it correctly, but also understand why the solution uh, works, yeah. or maybe to understand why one solution is more elegant than another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's right. And, and again, I, I kind of asked that scandalous question. I don't think I actually believe in it. Um, I, I actually believe in a, in a math class we should limit the calculators as much as possible. I think even in my example of logarithms, students have lost something over the years by using that. Right. So the the real analogy, I think, and I, you know, Eric, I think you're right. The analogy breaks down. But I think the real analogy is something like the mathematical proof. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe the, the calculator, if it's used in limitation, would be like a, a dictionary or a thesaurus mm -hmm. to maybe help you, um, you know, with pieces of your writing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I certainly would not want a calculator, or in this case a large language model, creating a proof for a student. Yeah. Right? I and that's the analogy of the, the student essay. If we were to find, um, well, first of all, I think that um, this technology might end up serving uh, students, uh, say, in physics or uh, chemistry, if you were to try to map an advanced model, you know, if it's sort of like MATLAB plus, if you were, you know, if you uh, have a, <clears throat> uh, if you want to uh, model how, uh, say, a bullet is fired from a gun and it, you know, goes X number of miles at a certain velocity and starts to slow down and then it's, and then it's, it's, it's height, you know, relative to the ground is, is going to decline as well at, at a certain point. You want to model that. Uh, that's a lot easier to use, uh, to model if you're using something like MATLAB than it is if you're, you know, draw out sure. on paper. And uh, it, it's possible that this technology will facilitate uh, advanced modeling for students. That seems like a very uh, advanced kind of language. I'm not sure there's room within right. a secondary education for that kind of language. Uh, in terms of helping humanities students, maybe in research. So uh, uh, something like if if um, if it can capture uh, statistical uh, breadth and uh, common ground, so that one's uh, kind of rhetorical uh, trajectory is more informed yeah. by you know. Uh, that, that might be good. Aristotle says a good rhetor will look to lots of examples from the past 
to make an argument for mm -hmm. a, a course of action. So it's possible that um, ChatGTP could gather uh, a set of examples that would be either uh, more germane or maybe more various uh, to help a student in a research project. I'm, I'm skeptical of it, but it's possible. Yeah. How, do you, how do you think about trusting that information? I mean, like, it, well, we well, have this. Can we, can we stay on that? Sure. Well, I, I, I want to I get there, too. But um, one of the things I find interesting about the utility of the different LLMs is that they actually, uh, their, their, their utility is proportional to the inputs, the prompts. If you come to an LLM uh, with a deep knowledge and understanding of something and, and you prompt it in a robust way, um, you, you, you get better outputs. And, and so, in a sense, the, the platform itself assumes uh, that, uh, the, the, that its utility, in, in a sense, requires uh, the, the person that's engaging with it to have their own knowledge. And I, I think this gets to um, this sort of larger debate that we have going on. The, the, one of the most asinine things that, are, that is said by uh, the education pundits is this idea, you know, it was said when Google came out that you don't, you don't really need to memorize things anymore, have any interior knowledge, because it's all just available at your fingertips, right? Um, and, and, and of course, this, this immediately leads us into the deeper anthropological uh, questions. Uh, as education always does, right? I mean, it is, it is absolutely the case that education is first anthropology. And, and if you don't have an understanding of human flourishing that is true, um, then, then you will fall into the trap of thinking, well, if, if, it's, more, if it's more efficient, if the tool is more efficient, then it's better. Um, and, and that's the dehumanizing aspect of these tools. Yeah. But I think Andrew makes a good point, is that um, you know, what, we, what we can't do is just throw this out entirely. And you know, it would be like throwing the wheel out or other, other tools. Say, what is the proper use of the tool? And, and I think that one of the things that we can do as classical teachers is reinforce that, um, like any tool, the more that you have an interior understanding and grasp of the whole, um, the more that the tool becomes useful to you. Just like, you know, the hammer in the hands of a carpenter is more useful than in my hand. Um, and, and so I don't think there's any difference here. And I, so I don't think that we can, uh, or I don't think that we ought to, uh, uh, out, uh, you know, just outright say that, that, that these LLMs are evil or, or that they're not, well, you know, that there, there isn't some use that we could find within the classical ed world, but it's got to be anchored to a proper anthropology. But, but why is this not uh, like the ring in Lord of the Rings? Why is this not uh, Boromir saying, if, if I had this, I could control this? Es but, especially for something like LLMs, where we, we don't yet know, we, what we do know is there are emergent behaviors, and what we don't know is the limits of that. Google's so Gemini is the ring. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, Claude by anthro Anthropic probably isn't. ChatGPT is now lazy. Um, so it's interesting. I, not, not all LLMs are the same. And that, that's the other thing that they're, they're let's be honest, they're not, the, the, found, the baseline model uh, is aggregating the web. But what each one of these competitive LLMs is doing is building logic upon that, right? And, and, and so I think it gets to the question of what are you building on that base layer? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to, uh, I, I think we will see uh, people taking uh, that, the, 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 you know, I've heard it said once, the AI needs IA, it needs information architecture, right? And, and so the information architecture that you see in Gemini is one that I think is downright uh, uh, destructive to civilization. Right. But, that does, but that's, not, um, uh, that's not inevitable, right, within an LLM. Well, I don't know. That's my question, right? So, so here, here's my real concern, which we're probably very far afield from the classroom, and we'll, we'll get back there. But here's my real concern about LLMs, right? We already know they have emergent behaviors, right? There are, there are early models that, have, that, that came out that were trained uh, long before even ChatGPT just on uh, language transcription. So it would, it would mm -hmm. hear what you're speaking and, and put it down. And they were only trained on the English language. And out of nowhere, the models started being able to do this in Persian. Right? I mean, this, so, so we know these things have emergent behavior. My biggest concern about LLMs is not 
but some kid, some 14-year-old kid in his grandma's basement in rural Nebraska goes onto ChatGPT and says, how do I bring down the electrical grid? And ChatGPT tells him. That's not actually my biggest fear. My biggest fear is that same kid, 14 years old, goes on to ChatGPT and says, how do I bring down the electrical grid? ChatGPT does not give him an answer. It just brings down the electrical grid. It actually has emergent behavior where everything's wiped out. So I, I go back to this question, right? Is this really the ring? Like, are we embracing something where we say we, we can control this thing even though we don't know everything about it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there, Elon has a particular perspective. Sam has a particular, you know, I, 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 I'll just, I'll say, I'm, yeah. I hope that's not the case, but I, I think it actually goes back to what, what, what are the, what's the information architecture that you're yeah. building on, on top of it? And I think the, the, the guys that are working on these are, that, that is a huge debate going on. In fact, I, it sounds to me that the, even at OpenAI, uh, it's caused oh, uh, real rifts, yeah. right? Um, and, and so is it, is it possible that it ends up, it ends up doing those things? I think it, it, it is possible, um, but it, it seems to me that it's only possible if uh, you build an open source model and just let it run. Mm -hmm on its own and you, you don't actually build guardrails. I think the guardrail conversation is something yeah. that's really interesting. So Andrew, let's let actually just bring this back to the classroom, right? Um, what, is, uh, what is a humane letters teacher or a lit comp teacher, or, or for that matter, an elementary school teacher who's having kids start to write, what are they to do with this? There was a, a New York Times article several months ago um, that said that the, the answer specifically in classical education uh, is to eliminate the student essay. Uh, to say, look, you can't fight this. Um, what we need to do is to go back to an older form, which is really just the seminar. Mm -hmm. Should we get rid of the essay uh, because of ChatGPT? We should not get rid of the essay. We should not get, a, get rid of writing. We should not end writing culture. Uh, uh, the, end of, the end of writing would be the end of Western culture, which is our culture. It's the culture in which liberal learning uh, uh, was fostered and um, by which we, we understand the liberal disciplines. Um, so how do we preserve it? Uh, interesting, in, uh, I did a little research toward this conference knowing I was going to be on this panel and I interviewed uh, three university professors, uh, all of whom are, are kind of, and one of them was a dean, a dean of humanities. Uh, and one was the point person at a East Coast University in charge of this very concern. None of them have very good solutions. And so these are university professors, high scholars who are spending lots of time uh, trying to think through this problem. Uh, but I did find some things that uh, I had thought through a little bit myself and I was grateful that somebody wiser than I confirmed a couple of my instincts. One thing we can do is we can have more in-class writing. Uh, teachers can revert to the old blue book format. Uh, the immediate downside, somebody will say, well, the habit of handwriting <laughs> is, is you know, on the decline as well. But all the humanity, uh, humanities related uh, habits are on decline. Like, increasingly students are, are not reading, Inclusing, increasingly students are not writing, increasingly students are not interested in you know, class discussion. So it makes our jobs harder but that doesn't mean our jobs are not worthy, and it doesn't mean that uh, it's not useful to try to advance those skills. Um, it's possible, too, that we could have, um, you know, uh, in-class writing and facilitate um, uh, the disengagement from the Internet during that writing time. We could have um, a bank of laptops that are not connected to the Internet. It, that is a, a doable technology. It'll obviously cost some money. It'll mean you have to infrastructurally have to have a place for that to happen. But it could be that increasingly we're going to have to have our students uh, write in class. All three university profs said that their universities are upping their uh, character game. That is, they're talking more and more about the honor code. And they're trying to appeal to the moral sensibilities of their students. So they're not condescending to them. They're not saying, we know you're going to cheat. And so we're going to throw up the barriers to prevent this kind of cheating. They are throwing up barriers to prevent that kind of cheating. But their, their number one tact is to say, you are humans. Our culture is for you and for your benefit, for the good of those you will serve when you leave our, our quarters. So we want you to rise to the culture and the mission of the university that you've decided to attend. The, the, the irony here, isn't it, that, that, that it's the classical program that's more prepared 
to meet this moment uh, than those schools that have abandoned writing, that have abandoned reading, that have abandoned uh, seminar, um, that, that actually the classical school should be able to go back to the blue book um, and, and, ha- and expect it in cursive and expect it done beautifully. I, I think it's a, it, it's a beautiful irony yeah. in a sense that, that classical schools are more prepared to meet the technovized moment than anybody else who has embraced right, technology wholesale. But here's, if, here's, we, if we were to talk about a national culture in which immodesty is through the roof as a problem, right. most classical schools have some form of a uniform. And the uniform frees the students from a lot of the things that kind of drag them down into typical uh, stupid teenage culture. Yeah. You know, and, and it's a good thing. And it's, and it's good for us, too, who teach in schools like this that we have a dress code. So I would prefer to wear a T-shirt and blue jeans, but when I'm teaching in a school, I dress like this because, yeah. you know, we're all about learning and the uniform uh, helps. So yeah, I think it's true. I think the classical schools are well positioned to, to meet this. Andrew, I can't imagine you in a T-shirt. And blue. I can't. No one I never asked you want to. to see that. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to wear tennis shoes today, but I didn't. <laughs> I took them. Uh, here's my issue, though, right? So I, I agree. I think this is right. We're going to have to do in-class writing. We can't abandon writing because writing structures thought. It's not just that your thought structures your writing, but the process is the very thing that we're losing. Um, but here's my concern. Uh, well, it's twofold. One, one is practical. One is, is actually pedagogical. The practical thing is the more stuff we do in class, class time is so precious that we, we try to tell our teachers to, to only do those things in class for which that class is uniquely seated, suited to do. If we're now going to take a bunch of time to start writing, we lose time. So okay. that's a practical thing. But, but, but my real question, though, Andrew, is, is a much more pedagogical one, and that is the process of revision. Right? Uh, writing is not simply about, let's take this hour, let's go through this, write this down. It's also about letting that sit, coming back a couple days later. And, and you know, again, my concern here is, like, what is that kid doing in the evening? Yeah, but 50 GPT? years ago, this is what we were doing, and we produced... I mean, maybe not 50 years ago. We're almost 50. Uh, 100 years ago, uh, we, that, that was all done in class, and we produced some pretty darn well-educated, no, I well... Don't, I don't think it was all done in class. I think some writing was done in class, but I think there is time for students to take their essays, go I home, think saying. about them, revise well, them, why couldn't, come back. You're saying you can't... I'm worried the kid takes, goes home and uses chat GPT and then brings those ideas back uh, okay, to their parents. Okay, so, so on the front end... Um, there are two steps that I think uh, ought to be taken. They could be done at home or in class, but done uh, by hand. Number one is to uh, brainstorm. And uh, brainstorm on paper. And to brainstorm means to just put all your thoughts on paper without concern for form and uh, rhetorical purpose. Just write everything that comes to mind and you submit your brainstorming. And then uh, the next step is to outline and submit your outline. I think if those two steps were taken, that is such an investment of the student's mind mm-hmm. in the thought required in an essay that the likelihood of sort of abandoning that thought and going all the way to uh, relying on chat GPT uh, really declines. I think, I think that good. And then if that's the case, then, you know, I think there's greater assurance on the teacher's part that the student's writing is going to be uh, the student's own writing. And when it comes time for revision, I think the teacher will be able to see the difference between the student's writing, built on the brainstorming and on the outlining, uh, and say an over uh, writing that's clearly over reliant on some other source. Um, we are. I'm watching the clock here, so we're getting to about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll chat a little bit more, but at this point, if you do have questions, uh, it would be good to come to the microphone, kind of line up, so we can respond to those. Um, uh, and while you're doing that. What are your other concerns about ChatGPT? Like we, we talk a lot about writing because that's that's what it does right now, right? But the large language models are are you know fundamentally they're actually not about language. They're about patterns, right? We have LLMs that are, for example, analyzing uh, uh, Wi-Fi signals, right? So the LLM itself is not specific to, la- to to human language. That's one application of it. What, what are your other concerns beyond student writing of, of the use of these things or the presence of these things uh, in our educational era? I mean, they're myriad. I, 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 I think I would, and I want to get to the questions, but I, I, I would say that we, we touched upon my, my biggest concern is that that barrier that it creates 
uh, between people and and the inherent laziness that that sort of is fostered. So would you, for example, uh, condemn, uh, endorse, or something in the middle uh, the let's say the production of a uh, Aristotle persona, like a video uh, av- a video avatar? You we hire an actor, uh, and students can go actually interact with Aristotle. Uh, in order to learn his thoughts. Yeah, condemn. Through, through, not through typing. Yeah, like, uh, we're getting to the point where we can do this. Yeah, and it's going to be done, and, and there will be classical schools. There will be educators in, in this room that get, that get enticed by that, and you shouldn't. Um, I, I think that's, again, I, I would, if we had more time, I'd want to talk about the difference between um, what's good for children and what might be fun for adults to play around with. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, I think there's a line there to be drawn. I think that takes that would require more exploration. But I would just say you can kind of see where I'm going. That when it comes to the development, the sort of first exposure to yeah. these men and women, uh, that first reading, um, I, I would I would say absolutely no. You Sorry, don't. I hear you don't a principle do that. in here. I think is important, which is we have to understand as teachers, what are we doing? Yes. Like what, is the, what is the thing that we're called to do with students? But would I like to play around with, yeah, yeah, as an adult? Sure. I'd be okay with it. I think- let's, let's, let's actually get to some questions here because uh, we're developing a line. We have about 13 minutes. Um, Dr. Mulhall. Two quick things. First, I was the first year in my high school that was allowed to use a calculator when we hit logarithms. And I don't know what a logarithm is. That's exactly right. (laughs) Second, we had a case at our college where a student was accused of plagiarism, and his defense was that he hadn't plagiarized. ChatGPT had plagiarized, which is an interesting (laughs) hair-splitting exercise. Um, But my question is, is kind of larger. Why do they do this? And, the, and, the, and the, the idea is, because I've, I've spoken to them and I said, all right, you, you, you're paying tuition to come here, right? Like, you've bought a gym membership. And part of the workout regimen that we have recommended is to do a certain number of reps. And you have hired a machine to do those reps so that you can chick, tick off the box that those reps were done. Don't you see how stupid that is? So there has to be an appreciation from the student that this exercise, what we're asking them to do, actually does something for them. Because it, it, it is a lack of appreciation for that that leads them to seek the shortcut. Let, let, but, let, me, but, take, let me take an optim- optimistic view, though, of what... Uh, so. So it forces us as teachers to make that argument again and not go in assuming that they understand the value of what they're getting, right? That, they, that, 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 that the, 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 the um, uh, temptation is to just think, well, I need, this, I need a diploma at the end of the day because that's what makes me uh, useful in the marketplace, right? That's the underlying assumption. And so if we're not, again, anthropology, if you're not speaking back to them what human flourishing is and doing that repeatedly, sort of like the preacher has to preach grace every freaking Sunday because you forget. If we're not doing that as educators and reminding them of their humanity, then they will devolve into thinking they're just machines and that utility is the highest good. And so I think it puts the onus on us again to be clear about that over and over and over again. And if that's not what you want, then you don't want our institutions. 100%. Now, what I heard in the question is, why do students do this? I, I would go back to, to the comment I made about how students see education. And I think what Eric's saying is we've got to preach what real education is. The reason why they do that is because they have seen education through the lens of a, 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 data, a database mentality, right? When I gave these bonus problems, students would go to the internet to look them up, and they did not see that as problematic right. because they weren't word for word copying it. They saw it as resourceful. Yes. They were right. going to find the answer. I did the thing you asked me to do, <laughs> which is to present a solution to this problem. They didn't see it as an issue. Right. What we, so that's why they're doing this. What we have to do is to bring them back through constant preaching to a model of education that says you really need true knowledge. You need to understand meaning. We're trying to understand essences and natures and things and and jar them out of that database culture. Yeah, one suggestion, have an essay, the first essay, corrected, not graded. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
I, that's a great idea. I think that, uh, to, to piggyback on this, I think the experience of actually learning, the experience of writing, the experience of working through something on your own uh, needs to be explained. Um, I think, and I think actually part of the explanation will be something utilitarian. And this is what I mean by this. We know through neurology that if you give uh, a young person uh, before puberty um, and you give that young person a piano or a classical guitar or a violin or a cello and that young person spends years, uh, the, the, all the science indicates that the synapses that happen in that kid way, way go beyond anything that normal kids who aren't playing hard instruments uh, are experiencing. In other words, we know that kids get really smart if they do uh, classical music. And, and I think something comparable happens across the board. We know from the Silicon Valley days that the leaders of that movement don't send their children to schools that are um, tech heavy. Why is that? Because there's something miraculous about putting your, your finger on a pencil and your pencil to the paper or your piece of charcoal, you know, and drawing. Uh, we heard a beautiful choir this morning. We heard another one, I think it was yesterday. There's something miraculous that happens when you get a group of people together and they sing in concert or they play instruments in concert. Uh, you can't replace that experience. You, you can't sort of farm that out and say, we're going to have a group of people here and they're all going to uh, participate uh, uh, technologically in a, in a symphonic experience. That, th that is not symphonic experience. That's not concerted effort. That is not aesthetic experience, and it's not going to grow uh, synapses. <laughs> it's, you're, you're actually going to be dumber for the whole experience of relying upon uh, technology too much. And I'll also say, Eddie, I agree. Uh, I think the rampant use of calculators has made people worse at math, not better at it. Let's go to the next question. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how to discuss this with students. I've heard a lot of opinions. One is don't even mention that it exists. Just come, uh, you know, just kind of deal with it when it comes up. The other extreme is give them a homily about why it's bad. I mean, there's just a lot of ways that you can handle this with students. So I'm wondering what you all think about that. Let's go to our resident preacher. Um, how do you discuss this with students? Well, I, I, like anything else, I think you have to give, the vi give them a vision of the good, right? So, so ignoring it is bad. Uh, just talking about w why you think it's uh, bad is bad. Um, if we're not constantly giving our, our kids, uh, like honoring them and their dignity and that, and, and that they're actually created to, to, to want to know what the good is, um, and, and to be treated as though they're capable of understanding. If we're not giving them sound reason for that, then, then we won't win their hearts. Uh, and so I, what I was saying earlier is just that a, a, great, a great teacher uh, is, is um, taking them seriously uh, and, and, and is giving them a vision of something more beautiful always, right, than the cheap simulacra uh, that uh, that the market is you know giving them or that technology is giving them so but it's a constant battle I, I would also add to this uh, that's a great answer of what to tell kids but in uh, in the process of trying to form students in this uh, I, I would want to know what does the teacher tell themselves right and by this I mean uh, we want to do everything we can to form students we want to talk to them about this we want to put it out an image of the good um, we should not put too much on our own shoulders, right? It turns out there is free will, uh, and, <laughs> and uh, even Jesus lost one of 12. He lost more than that well, for a little bit. That, but um, but I, I think, I, I think it's, it can become easy to become uh, dismayed by this, when all of a sudden you have students who you know are turning in essays, for example, that were generated by ChatGPT. We still want to do everything we can, um, but not put too much on our shoulders. In the end, that there is free will, right? Next. So my question will be uh, related to how the adults, the teachers and administrators can use this to enhance their craft. So for instance, uh, you mentioned Neil Postman's uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. So I, I uh, went on chat G uh, GPT a couple weeks ago and said, uh, compare that book with Plato's Allegory of the Cave about perception and reality. And actually the information I got back was not bad. 
uh, but it has caused me to think. So are there ways that you would recommend that we could use this tool to enhance the things that we do in our school? Andrew, you're in the business of teacher formation. Uh, is there a way in which something like ChatGPT can be used by a teacher to help them prepare for lessons, create lessons, um, get smarter about things? Um, I, I don't see it right now, but I, but, uh, and, and thank you for the question. I, I would challenge the premise of the exercise you just engaged. So, and, and I actually I see something similar all the time and I push back on it. There, there's, a, uh, there's a habit to take something like the allegory of the cave and to pull it out of context and then do something with it. So there are, I, I've run, run into a number of schools that just read that allegory as a standalone. I don't think that's a good idea. It's actually part of, of a long 10 book exercise by Plato to move his interlocutors toward the moment where they can finally make a good decision uh, for justice. And uh, um, related to the previous question, I, I would encourage teachers to, to look at a book like Plato's Republic uh, or to t have the students look at a book like Plato's Republic and, and to work through it to find how those individuals c come to see the distinction between power and responsibility. So if you take the word, you know, cleverly say response ability, right, an ability to respond, that's not the same thing as having power over somebody. Rather, to have the ability to respond to others justly, lovingly, truthfully, sympathetically, that, that requires a set of experiences and skills and understandings that can't be summed up uh, statistically nor accrued as a matter of uh, power over the other. So. Um, one other, you know, Baconian line that, that knowledge is power, that's, high, that's a highly problematic way to look at knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the, the chat GPT, uh, because it's be, all modern technology has a tendency to uh, pull knowledge away from responsibility and toward power. Uh, so anyway, uh, not to beat up on that exercise too much, uh, and I, I, without reading the, you know, what you discovered, I, I don't really deny that you found some, some insights there, but my m greatest concern would be that the students stop seeing their own capacity as persons to respond to other persons and to the world around them, and rather see uh, learning, so-called, uh, as an opportunity to have power over the situation. So they don't actually have to respond. They, they, they actually can, can, can get around uh, the, the activity that's at the center of being a person. Before we get to Zach's question, Eric, you have a follow-up well, on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think the, 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 it's a question about what the, what, 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 what the role is of the school in, in first introducing students to the text. And, and I do, again, I go with the understanding that we're giving them a first read, you know, not their second or third read, that as they come to understand each of the individual texts, they do start to naturally uh, make connections between those. And so I want to, I kind of want to draw a line here and say that you, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to encourage students to do what you're doing, right? I, I, I can see that if you, if you have done the work of understanding, you know, Marx and, and, uh, and, and Plato and others, and you, right. you, you, you want to kind of play around with what are different ways of thinking about applicability between the two. Yeah. As an adult, that, that, might, that might be a fun act of leisure, uh, but I think it'd be really dangerous to encourage students to do that, right? Um, I, my other thing would say that, you know, to your question about its uses in a school, I think there are immense uses on the shared services business operations side. Right. Um, and, and so that, those are very different ecosystems within a school, right? The academic and the, and the business ecosystems. But I, I will, we could do a whole other panel on this, but I think that uh, we would be foolish as a movement if we didn't start to use LLMs uh, uh, to make us more efficient on shared services and operational matters. Zach? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have an analogy that I want to put before you all, and then uh, a question that goes along with that, and it's a variation on the, the previous questions. So I was thinking about this analogy that I think you'll appreciate is the relationship between uh, youth and, let's say, alcohol. And on the one hand, you could just pretend that doesn't exist, that that's not a temptation for kids, and ignore it. I think we'd all say that's a bad approach. Another side, you could be preaching the, the dangers of that often, and maybe 
you know, advocating pure abstinence from that. On the other hand, though, and I think this is an approach a lot of people take, is how to use that responsibly. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, is I, I'm very much of the approach in the middle on ChatGPT so far of just kind of abstinence from it, don't, don't use it as students, but I am just challenging myself and wondering what you ha uh, if you have thoughts on this. Is there a way to actually instruct students to use it in some way that's good, rather than here's why you shouldn't use it and here's a higher vision of education? What do you all think? Well, um, it, it's an interesting comparison, alcohol and, and chat, GBT. Uh, you know, every school worth its salt is going to have a prohibition on alcohol use, you know, during school time. Yeah. But the, the schools will by have... By students. Yeah, by students. Yeah, I mean, come yeah. on, Andrew. <laughs> I, I wouldn't encourage you to have a rule that allowed the teachers to drink on school time. <laughs> it's a tough I, well, job, But Andrew, in terms I mean, of come on. helping the students, I, I would free them up from <laughs> drinking <laughs> on school time. Um, but, you know, who's going to train the, the students... To, to, to drink in moderation, if they drink at all. It's going to be mom and dad. Exactly. And uh, uh, schools have this much ability to form moral virtue. They have a great capacity to train intellectual virtue. Uh, Chat GPT uh, comes in at the intersection of the, of the two because, uh, and, and my main concern right now is, is not the moral end. My main concern is the intellectual end, that it, it truncates the uh, rightful, a role of a of a, a student and a teacher, and that is to move toward true knowledge, deeper understanding, and deeper experience. Um, the word "person" comes from the Greek word "prosopon," which literally means the mask that the Greek actor wore. So that the mask mediated between the audience who could experience catharsis through the the tragedy presented, and the actor and the playwright. Uh, later on, person takes on deeper meanings through iconography, say, you know, imagery of, of uh, Christ who is claimed to be both God and man and so forth. Uh, the beautiful imagery of um, black African slave on the medallion during the abolition movement where the, the, the person of the black African slave mediated between all slaves and those who could do something about it. This is what I mean by responsibility. That is, it, it's the, ultimately, it's a very, as, uh, this is something I agree with, uh, Professor Montaz, I, I didn't agree with everything he said, but he did say that education is very personal. I found that it, he, he thought it was more subjective than I would claim it to be. But in terms of persons, that's where the action is. That is, we carry one another. That the meaning of being a person is to mediate uh, between others and ourselves and others in the world that we experience. So a poet has an experience, she writes about it in the compact form of a poem affords us the opportunity to recreate for ourselves the experience. What I'm worried about is that chat GPT will intercept that relationship between the poet, the world, the one who reads the poet, and the one who can re recreate the experience. So we have just so. a few more minutes. I want to get to the very last question. It's you. Last question. Nice. Uh, so I noticed that the conversation kind of focused around the most powerful large language models that we have access to right now. Um, I have a question about what I would call neutered uh, large language models. Uh, the explosion of these models is due to the conversational nature of the interface. They're incredibly non-technical, natural language in, natural language out. With some tweaking, do you think it'd be possible to use these models as a source of individualized Socratic engagement, such as the model Conmigo already being used by Khan Academy, the largest online learning uh, uh, platform in the world? Yeah, so this, this, this gets a little bit at the, the question I was asking. Do you, is there a way in which some of these models are you know, not being open, but closed and carefully controlled? Uh, and can we get those to the point of, say, individual student, student tutoring? So I think I understood uh, the various aspects of that. Uh, would you, rec so supposing it wasn't chat GPT, but a much more controlled model that, let's say, was actually even built off of your curriculum, right? That was, that was the data set. We fed in the textbook. We fed in uh, the lesson plans. We interviewed teachers. And that became the data set from which the large language model uh, was, was learning. Would you advocate that uh, for student tutoring? No. Why? I, I, you know, we, we should spend another hour talking about the debates between Hobbes and, yeah. and Descartes. Um, it's a false copy, right? So 
So the idea that it's this computation, right, that Socratic engagement is just about outputs, and it's not about acts of deep friendship, you know, that, that, that there's something transcendent that's going on, and, and, that, um, and that there's love involved and, 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 and real friction and, and all of these things. I think um, it falls into the trap of thinking that it's just about getting answers, right? It's just, it's an ends means problem, I think, and, and, uh, and I think you, you lose the transcend in that sense, and you would reinforce that um, what, you're trying, what you're trying to do through the seminar, through, through the Socratic method or whatever, is, um, is get information, and just information. And I think that's, that's not all you're doing. I mean, that's a part of it, but it's like every heresy has some truth in it. And it's just a, it, it's a, it's an explosion of that truth to its logical absurdity, and, um, or illogical absurdity, or illogical whatever. Yeah. So I, I think you're, you're losing the humanity of it, and, and that's why I would, no, I would, I would think it would be bad. Yeah, let me wrap it up here, uh, and I will close us out by, by further answering that question. Uh, I would say no, but, but I think, you know, you're, you're hinting at this at the end, Eric, um, what it means to be human is to interact with other humans. And I am very concerned about any technology that gets in the way of that. Uh, and I'm very concerned about stuff that starts to emulate it. Uh, I think that the end of that could actually be a confusion on the student's part about what it means to be a human person. And I think the closer that the models get to emulating human language, the more dangerous that is. Right? I have the same concern about virtual reality. I actually get much more concerned about virtual reality once it gets better, because it's now giving the illusion of reality that's not actually reality. In, these com in, in the conversation about large language models and students interacting with it, the better it gets, the more it models human language, whether you're using it in, for tutoring, for classroom, as an adult, I have a lot of concerns about things that start to blur those lines. We're already in a battle uh, where we're trying to get students to understand what it means to be human because of a lot of the heresies that are out there. Um, giving them a model that confuses that question uh, I think is particularly dangerous. Um, we really could go on for another hour uh, or two. Uh, we will be around, of course, for the rest of the conference if people want to talk about this individually. Uh, Eric, uh, great friend. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, also a great friend of ours. Uh, thank you for your time, your preparation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank all of you for attending this session. Thank you.